Let's get started. Huh? You should tell me when I need to start. Okay. So uh, today, at the third se session, I'm going to uh, talk quickly about a very fun but powerful uh, tool uh, in principle a category of uh, regression models or classification models, which are called ensembles. And then I show you one real application that I developed in the case of real estate market. And I also tell you how to get the data from, and then briefly I just tell you how to implement data. So, so if you if you remember these things that we discussed last last session, and I call it a computational graph, and then we said this, for example, was a case with a, a like for example, uh, this was a case with a linear regression. One, one, one regressor, and then if we said, for example, if we have polynomials, in principle, we are adding just the, the layers here, and so on. And now think about it that if we have these kind of things, imagine now we have 10 computational nodes, and forget about this neural network story and gradient descent. Just think about it that if each of these nodes are like a polynomial regressor, and then they all use, in principle, the same input dimension and the same uh, a similar degree and then if they use a similar training data in principle what happens you expect so in principle they should if if you have a deterministic system it they should be redundant right so the idea of ensemble is that how as i as i told you in principle later we go to the other methods like convolution and so on i tell you again this is story and then all these methods are just tricking how to think about this architecture. And here, for example, if we do this simply with the same data set, the result is not better than one node in the middle layer because they are all redundant, right? So the idea of ensembles is that how to get benefit of them. So how to think about ensembles like, like a committee of experts, not having replicated one single expert replicated, how to have several experts. So in principle, the idea of ensembles is to have how to have biased models where if they talk to each other the result is always good so one thing you can like one single model you can think about it like a dictator yeah it's very naive but just think about it and then the here is like you have a community of experts they always talk and they're always biased and if they're not biased it's not good so they should be really expert in one thing about that problem and then when they talk in this layer this is the idea their final result Will be sh you will see that always gets better than one single one. So this is a kind of thinking about it's a decentralized and biased entities, a kind of agents, where versus a centralized and global model. So let's start with this idea that we have like one layer. Uh, these layers, they're all everything is the same. So here, as you remember, we have this regression. The data is a toy data set. So we always say, let's fix the degree. So we always have one degree that I will decide. And then we say like, how many uh, estimator we want. And then the data set is always the same training data set. Right? So they always, like these regressors, think about it like, a, like, I don't know, creatures. And they, they are thinking and they are looking at some data set. If you have different data set, in principle, the results would be different. But now if the data is the same, because the machine is deterministic, we expect that the result is the same, and it is the case. So here, if you have, depending on the degree, you see that the patterns is changing. This is what we had last, last week. But then this green actually is an overlap of several of them. You will see that in the next uh, ex experiment, the result is different. And then here, what you see is always one thing, because they're overlapping. And think about these lines as these nodes here. This is what I told you. So now what we are going to do here in simple example is that I show to each of these regressor different data sets by random. So this is in the field, if you want to know the keyword, it's called resampling. Resampling means that you have a data set and then you want to pick, uh, or sampling or resampling. Sampling means that you want to pick some samples of your data set. And then what happens if you train? So here we have in principle two main strategies. Sometimes we have sampling with replacement, sometimes we have sampling without replacement. Sampling with replacement is called bootstrap. I don't know why, but this is a way of also, I mean, historically, I don't know why, 
but it's a very uh, uh, classical problem in statistics. Here, what we do is that we have these 10 nodes, for example, for each of them, we take 25% of your data, you train them, and see what, hap what happens. So another term that you need to know is, uh, it's called bagging, which is a bootstrap aggregator. So in principle, here the idea is that instead of training all of these regressors with the same data set, simply split your data set, and then with re replacement, so we do bootstrapping, and then train them, and then simply at the end, vote and then aggregate the results with a select weighted sum, right? So this is called bagging. And in principle, as you can see here, these models are independent. They are just looking at random data sets. But for example, later you will see that in self-organizing maps, these nodes are collaborating together to cover the space of the data space. Here you don't have it, just let you know. So what I do here now, I'm changing this. Now I'm just saying the degree should be a value uh, between 2 and 10 for each of them by random and also each of them only see 25% of the data right? so again now it's just one estimator if I increase the number of estimators you see they are almost you see these blue lines and then the green is that just simply average right it still is not so satisfying and that's what the point I want to reach, and, and then I want to start what is this uh, ensemble. I mean. The idea here is that you see even with this randomization, they have l some kind of uh, local uh, changes, but overall the pattern is not changing. And that's when you can say that in principle, if you remember the first session, I had this one single line versus a lot of points. Here's the case. Even you show 25% of your data, because the method is based on this global assumption, it's not that different. So in a way, it's very robust, which is good, and sometimes bad because you cannot make them biased. So always, even if you show 25% of your data, each of them try to know the whole pattern. So they don't get good results for some of the data points. They always get average good results. So that's not what we are interested in ensembles. So the idea which is funny and that the, uh, the, there were like this 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 uh, development in during late 1990s was that they said you should use weak learn weak learners not uh, global average estimators so these weak learners are there's another term you should know uh, those learners or those methods that overfit to your data the which means that if you have a training data they get very good results for your training data they have very bad results for the test data this is where you don't have generalization. But regression, regression, this polynomial regression has a good uh, generalization because it always finds the average line. It doesn't give you very good result for the training, so it's not overfitting. But here, definitely, you need to overfit your data. Because if you have overfit data, overfit models, then you can share the, their knowledge. So it's very simple. And <laughs> that maybe you know this model is uh, you have decision trees. And decision tree, you can uh, understand what it is from its name. And in principle, is like this. You have seen this many times, right? So you have like, for example, uh, here two variables, and then you split your data points. And then here, for example, you have a problem that you have four classes of A, B, C, D. And then simply you just uh, find this splitting point, and you just say if X1 is larger than T1, goes to, for example, this, this, this direction, this branch, and if it's not, usually it's A, so this is from your data set, you s really do that, and, and this is a method called decision tree, and there are lots of algorithms for that, and then you, you split your data like this, and then later when you have a new data set, it's like a really like a rational decision making, you just say, okay, I know the first variable which is important is X1, X1 is larger than this or smaller than this, if it's this, you go this direction, and you, you automate this process, and this is called decision tree, and it's a very bad method in itself. But you will see that when they are working together, they're much uh, stronger than any other methods that you will see. So here is a very, I uh, know, there are algorithms, I don't want to go through it. But here is a very uh, fun example of how it, this decision tree works. I go, it's a data set of uh, homes in, uh, in San Francisco and New York. So the question is that can you predict if this place is in San Francisco or in New York, for example? So you have several variables and it, it tells you how to split them and so on. I just want to go to the last part. I think they spend a lot of time to prepare these visualizations. I know this D3 is really hard to work. And 
So here they, for example, they start with the elevation data. They say in, in San Francisco, most of the time, the elevation of the houses is really high because it's like on top of the hill. So they have this point and look at it. It's like blue, for example, is like San Francisco and then or the other way around. Uh, blue is New York and the, uh, the, the green is San Francisco. It says only based on elevation, you can split data properly. And then after elevation, if it's more than 200, for example, uh, feet, then you go to the uh, two different things. And down you now you ju just focus on the price. For example, the idea is that uh, the houses in New York are ex more expensive. So then you can split your database on that. And then you, you go, go down. down. And, and this, this is the way, way it splits, splits the data. data. But, but in principle, you don't need to learn this. But it's just to look at it how it works. And, and this, this is the flow of your data, data on this. And then at the end, if you want to visualize this pattern, it's actually like that. So this is the data and this is your decision tree. And you mm -hmm. automate this and then in principle, if you want to write this like an if then rules, you need to do it. But here, the algorithm finds out automatically itself. So now if you run it like this, it tells you that uh, it gets up to 100% accuracy on your training data. So this is overfitting because it's clear, it's just count. <coughs> okay, I add one more uh, rules and then you have no limit in this number of layers. You can add more layers and then you just split your data set. This is the whole idea. And then you just automate it and it's called decision tree algorithm. And then if you do it for the, uh, the test data set, it's not that good, but it's good yet, it's 89%. So this is what I told you, it has a very good result for the training data, but not necessarily good result for your test data. So now what we are going to do with ensembles, and actually there was a very, uh, 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 I think seminal work by uh, Leo Bremen, I think I put it somewhere, in 2000, in 2000, I think this is, a, I think I really strongly suggest you to read this paper because he's a uh, known, uh, well known statistics, a statistician. And then he complains that in principle in statistics, you try to reduce the noise. But here I'm using noise or, or, or randomness as a resource. He said always you try to find the best parameters here. I just say, forget it. So he came up with the idea of random forest. He just said, if you have one decision tree, what if you have a forest of random trees and forget about the variables? And that's the whole idea, it's nothing more. So you simply <laughs> start with random trees, even if you don't decide about the layers, and it works. And I, I'm, tell you, I'm telling you that there is a, a like competition, a Kaggle competition, if you know. There's a, this website called Kaggle that they always come up with a question from some company. They say, we have this problem. Who can solve it? And then there is always a prize of 10,000, 100,000. <coughs> And there are lots of people <coughs> working. And then recently there was a survey, and then you can see that most of the uh, final result is just this ensemble. And it's just a matter of resources and a bit of uh, some tricks. Like last week I showed you, if you, do, if you do this logarithmic transformation, the result is much different, right? So it's, it's funny, and I think uh, because we are at the research side, we are not doing it. I think the idea is, to be honest, in terms of research, it's very simple. But in terms of application, is enormous. You can test with any data set that you get this and then just randomize it, and then it works. As long as you have non-homogeneous data. Because homogeneous data means like pictures. It doesn't make sense to use random features of, uh, random pixels of pictures, right? Because that's why we have this deep, uh, for example, convolutional neural networks. We will talk about it in maybe two weeks. So. Uh, now we do it with it, uh, what we call it, it's called tree bagging. So it's just, you have uh, trees with their own algorithms and then you just put them together. And then now you have this result and this is one regression. You see the difference between the uh, polynomial regression is very shaky and random because it tries to uh, find the 100% accuracy for the training data. And then gradually if you add more, you see that you don't have any longer this global view because in polynomial it is what experts like because in polynomial you just say I have if it's polynomial degree two I have three for example if you have one variable you have only three coefficients so you can explain everything and it's very uh, well received but here you cannot explain anything because it's like I don't know it's just a combination of random things and that's the way to deal with the complexity of your data set so if you increase this it gets almost 100% result on this training. But with the polynomial regression, you never reach to that point. So 
I, I go back again to this idea of uh, uh, this guy. This is, I think, a way to not to get lost. To think about it here, what we do here is that we randomize these edges. That's it. In polynomial regression, you or in a previous, for example, diff a neural network last week we talked, we had always fully connected layer. But when you say I randomize the features because I did okay. I mean, let, let me say something. You can you can think about your data matrix as a matrix, and then you can fork it from two directions. One is to say I select some of the features for one training for one decision tree, for example, and also you can think about which kind of which part of your data you want to show to your model. So this is uh, data selection. This is feature selection, and if both of them are happening by random. And when it's like that, now in this term, you should think about it when I have random feature selection. This means that not all of these points are connected to all of them. In the classical way, it is called fully connected layer, means that all of them are input to the next layer. Right? But here, that's the trick. Don't show all of them to all of them. And you will see that, in, for example, in deep learning, this is called dropout. Don't show everything to all the uh, nodes because they correlate. They get correlated to each other because it, they behave to compete with each other, and then in principle they learn. Uh, red they have redundancy. By this, you just remove the redundancy, and that's the way to explain it. And now, we, when we talked about this uh, like last week, now you can think about it. Now you can have in principle deep random forests also. That's not a problem. Right, you can add layers, and then what does that mean is that the output of this first layer is, what is just input to the layer, and then again you treat it like a, a decision tree, randomized decision tree. That's the whole thing. But why uh, mm -hmm. is random better than saying, okay, uh, if you will have a calculated system, so not the random, let's say you only connect every, you give 10% of connections. That's, that's but which 10%? Which the, the thing is that you don't want to engineer the features because if you want to engineer the feature then it's not generic the thing is here is that and it, because of that it's called machine learning is that it learns in principle a good solution for you but isn't it possible that you get shadows that for instance you have a random effect that, that there's parts that won't get it is possible but, if, no, but if you increase this layer the, sh the chances you can calculate the chances are like being like some part not being seen is really almost zero. You okay, can calculate yeah, yeah, yeah. because you can add a layer and then say for all of them just show 20% of your data set. Right. So this is possible. Okay, yeah. No, it, it is you can calculate it. What is the risk that some part of my data is not, for example, in the training? It's very low if you say if you if you sample properly, right. which is already implemented in this case. And well, the thing is that, which is, I think, I think the main problem for uh, like a person who really wants to know the system, here you really don't know the system. But it works. So that's the trade-off, whether you like it or not. For example, if you really want to build something, and then you want to say why this is happening, here is not a choice. But if you want to say, because there are lots of uh, things, I will show you, for example, a lot of applications. There are lots of applications that it doesn't make sense to make a theory out of that because it's too uh, uh, contextual, too, too, f too local and temporal. It, like you say, I want to know why people in this street walk like that. The classical way would be to make this system, to say, okay, I want, and then I want to generalize it. But then the moment you go from the first uh, street to the next street, then doesn't work. So the classical mindset is always happy to come up with it, uh, with a general theory, which is explainable. But in reality, you know that if you change the street, for example, you don't know why people go to this restaurant, why don't go to the other restaurant. But if you go to more physics-based systems, like for example, it works very well. And uh, even I found recently uh, how you can use this for uh, physics-based systems. For example, there's where let me find something. Uh, Here's a, a nice work by a group of uh, here, a uh, Disney research at ETH, Physics Forest, I think I've shown you. So what they do here is, in principle, they have a physics-based simulator, which is like a time series pr problem. They have particles of water, for example, molecules, and they, they move based on all the equations that you know. And then the thing is that here, the goal is for animation, real-time animation. 
because if you want to render a nice high quality animation it takes a lot of time what they do here is that they they know a system but they simply take the this problem as a kind of function approximation problem they take data from simulation they know there's a logic why it's like that but they they train a random forest with gpu here and that's the main contribution that it, it predicts the location of 1.1 million uh, particles in, in water and then it creates this kind of uh, crazy patterns that for example uh, they train it with lots of uh, uh, physics based simulations and then they take the even here I think it's like what you were asking me if I'm not wrong here they don't take arbitrary features they know meaningful features and then they feed this to a lot of random forests and now I think this is I think this is the uh, so-called emulator so it works in real time and if you want to use it with a physics space engine it might take a few like hours to just say I want to move my ball from this side so this is the prediction and also because they have a physics based uh, elements now they change their viscosity for example <laughs> and then you will see that if it's not water what happens But here the problem here is that since this model is trained only for visualization, they they tell you that you should not use this for, for example, flow of water really. If you <laughs> want to know what is flood risk, you should not <laughs> use this because this model is not designed for that. It's just designed to make beautiful visualization. Mm -hmm. And I think here they use millions of uh, uh, prediction at with the GPU. So it's super simple. And then you have rendering. And I think they have this let's say it different uh, and it's real time now and it's the same idea it's just a very very nice implementation of that which is fast so imagine I every move that you do is like you need to predict 1.1 million points what's the next step next next location so now you have these kind of things <laughs> which is crazy And then I think we have this one thing that I like, for example. Yeah, this one is cool. Even they have different mat material look. No, this is. And then they have this. Uh, I just, uh, yeah, this one, for example, is also cool. It's exactly the chocolate, and then you calculate. But so it's just one parameter. And the, th the thing is that they train it only once, and now they change this material parameter and the model has uh, has a generalization but here this simulator is not any longer physics based right so you don't really don't know what's happening inside, but you know that there is a logic for it. That's so because of the data? yes it learns from the data it's always like that but yeah. that is not uh, physically valid no it, I, I don't know if it's valid or not they say it's valid if, if you run the simulator you will get similar results they say it. but for example, one of these features is like the material. So you make it parametric and then you just say simulate with several of them and it learns in between what would be the behavior, for example. And it's just a guess. And who cares? He, simply here it's just animation. It's not about <laughs> like this. So it would be very powerful prediction. Yes. Yeah. But then for example for flood prediction there are different words. I'm I'm also involved in this. Uh, but for example for flood prediction sometimes you really don't care about the whole flow of water. You just Where want to know what is the maximum water level mm -hmm. and when this happens to which house. This is, for example, what you care. Of course, you can be a bit uh, <laughs> crazy to say, no, I just want to know all the flow of water. And, but yeah, that's it. For there, I mean, there you can ask different kind of questions. And, yeah. There, for example, I will show you this application. They, they use uh, a picture. They just say, well, if this is the picture of the uh, initial condition of water, what would be the outcome? And then you have all this uh, 3D information. And in principle, it learns the whole dynamics. And because of that, it's faster. Because you don't need to wait now to see what happens. You, there you can use I mean, these kind of things. But for example, yeah, these are possible. But the idea is the same. Nothing has changed. And, and the beautiful thing is that these are all nowadays automated, open source. You can use it easily. So I will show you, for example. So then there are different names you need to, I mean, learn later. And if you like, for example, you have this classical tree backing, 
which is just data bootstrapping, all the share the same uh, type of uh, uh, features. And then you have random forest that you, you fork your data or shuffle like this. So you have different data set for each of the decision trees and different features. And also you have extra trees that even you don't train, I think they don't train in uh, decision tree at all. So it's just a random uh, tree. And even it works, you will see. And that's it, I think, as I said. Uh, and then you can do a lot of uh, interesting applications depending on your question. So it's a kind of very generic and powerful and easy to use tool, but then you need to find good question. For example, in this water flow, the question is that, can I predict the flow of particles, for example? And I think it works very well. You don't need, in my opinion, deep learning in if you have non-homogeneous data, which is the case in most of the engineering applications. You have proper features. It's not like pixels of the data. They have meaning for them. Or they have, they have a sensing system. Each of them are, each of the features are coming from different sensors. They have a meaning. So you cannot mix them easily. So then, just as always, I tell you, check this. And you, you can be very fast. Scikit-learn has nice implementation. Adabos, and I did explain to you that there's another way. Now again, think about it. These are random and independent in principle trees, but you can do it sequentially. And this is called boosting. You just train a uh, random forest and you see in which part of your data you get add results. And next step, you say, okay, fix for the, this part of my data, or the second, this part of data that I don't get good results, train again a random forest for that. And it's like you have a sequential dependency. And this is called boosting. So there are lots of different names with boosting. So you will see here, for example, this classical one is Adabos, and then you have XGBoost, tagging, and then you can use it for classification if you have a categorical data, or you can use it for regression if you have uh, continuous data. Yeah, it's, I think it's like so I don't want to go through it because then it's just, yeah, it's right. I don't want to make it like a workshop. You can just play with that. It's, it's that. It's not more. So here I will show you one application that I developed. Uh, uh, some of you may know this application. And that's the idea of real estate market uh, prediction, for example. And the simple idea was very simple. I was curious about this uh, method. And I wanted to say if I, if I can predict, uh, uh, for example, property prices for each building, for example. So I started uh, approaching consulting companies and simply I know that they're using very old school method and sometimes they really use expert-based knowledge and they make it more expensive by that. But I said, if you give me uh, your data set, we, we can use this channel first. I don't tell them it's like this line of code, but <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's something called machine learning. <laughs> Yeah, super complicated, otherwise they don't pay. <laughs> but reality, because we are at university, we should know that it's not that complicated, regardless of what you hear in media. If you get the idea, then the rest is just small branches of this decision tree. Like, you get boosting, you get uh, uh, ensembles, and that's, that's it. And then you, for your application, you say, okay, it doesn't work, let's play with that. So then what I realize is that in real estate market, and it's global phenomenon, I think, you don't have data set. It's very funny. So they even, no, yeah, I don't mention their names here because we are recording, <laughs> but they simply say, we don't give you our data, and then we know that yeah, your model might be work better, but simply our system is plugged to banking systems, for example, in Switzerland. If somebody's going to get a loan, they say, okay, this location, right? So I am t I'm, t I'm telling you what is the price. And there, they use a very old school method. It's, this is not very accurate. So, yeah, this is my story. So we started thinking about where to get the data. And then I, here I just want to sh tell you that in this kind of context, it's always important where to get the data. For example, in the previous case, this water flow, you, you use simulator to get the data. And I think most of the applications, in the engineering application, you have a kind of simulator. Either you are using an, op an op optimization procedure, you can take your data from there. Or you have a sensing system, you can take your data. But in like most of urban applications that I'm interested, you don't have data in like, as, as as ready data set. So you need to find data according to your questions. So there are lots of ways to uh, collect data, and I just put it here. Later you can read it. But for example, one of the beautiful data set is like in cities is OpenStreetMap. This is the whole planet available nowadays. It's for free. You can download it less than one terabyte. 
is zipped also, but if you unzip it, it's a bit larger. But then you have, for example, this kind of data set, for example, let's say in Switzerland, I want to go to <coughs> oops, Zurich, for example, and then show me uh, where are all the shops, for example, different shops you have. And this is a con o completely open source data, you can download it. And think about Google has the same version, but you need to pay. I mean, it's, it's cheap, to be honest. But you, you, it's. I mean, let's let's find something which has a lot. The restaurant, for example, you just say fast foods, for example. I need to zoom a bit more. So it gives you all the locations. So if you are in this field of real estate, always this kind of data set is important. And I'm, I'm at the moment I'm developing these kind of systems that I'm looking and cleaning this data. So, for example, you get a one country and then you download it and then you simply get this so-called POI or point of interest data set. You have all the layers, and then think about it that now they are they're all of your features for your whatever your question. You want to know where is the best location to start a like a restaurant of this type. Then you can think about that, okay, I go to all of these restaurants of these types all over the world, for example, and then I look all the features around it. It's like a recommendation system. You just say, I think McDonald's is there when is these 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 things are there. So you learn it. You, you don't know why, but you can just guess, right? So you can use it also in a proactive way. So this is the data set that you can use, and I use it also in different applications. And then also, uh, it is, it's cool to check it out that now you can use it in a kind of gaming environments with, uh, with this kind of uh, augmented reality things. You can mix them together. So this kind of 3D with your mobile phone, AR kit, for example, and you can train your model that predicts, for example, what is this this artifact and then you can walk in the city but these are I mean arbitrary you, you can think about good applications also and then you can think about uh, like this kind of data oops okay it doesn't exist here um, yeah this I need to copy the files yeah okay I don't know it now but that's okay. so you can you can use a 3D uh, extrusion of the buildings okay everything you have geometry and everything and also, also you, you can, can do a use APIs, which is another story. But here what we do, which is very fun, is that problem. I don't know if you know it. And here the idea is very simple. You go to HomeGate, for example, in Switzerland. And then when you check, you need to know how to get the data. This is, for me, always equal to this machine learning code. You need to find good data. For example, you just say rents. Let's go rents. And then let's say apartments. I think you know this website, right? So. And then you go Zurich. And this is your data. And you don't know there, but the data is here. Now if you say, I want to know this value, where is this value? It's here, right? This is an HTML structure. And then with the crawler, <laughs> you write a, a simulator of this guy. So I do, and this is like a table, simply. And they have a structure, because they, when they want to write this website, they need to have a structure. When you fill the form, it comes up. So with the crawler that you can do different things is that you write the crawler, crawler that says, okay, I have the zip codes of the whole Switzerland, and you should be polite to the to the server also. It's important because otherwise, if you want to send, I'm I'm sending forty thousand uh, requests per day. You see it here, but I mean I'm in discussion with them also if they give me API access or not. But yeah, apparently they don't. But now what you can do here is that you get this data set and you convert it to a CSV file because you have a structure. It's always address, rooms, living space and so on. You write this small uh, code, it again, again, you don't need to write everything from scratch. This scikit-learn is there for machine learning and then you have, for example, Fiverr as a website for a lot of people all around the world. You just say, I have this website, I need this kind of specification of the kind of result in your data. And then you pay $50, they give you the crawler in Python. So you need to know how it works. And then now this is what is working. Yeah. I wrote them by myself most of them, but if, if you don't want to do it, for example, it's a cheaper way because they guys are experts. And also you can get data, for example, different apps kind of things. It's not just real estate. So what we did is that at the end, so now you have, after cleaning, you have something like this. So this is just, now I have rent zip code, type of apartments, 
uh, and then you have rooms, year of construction, and then living space, and that is. So for these, for example, you need to use a Google API, I don't want to go to it, that you just, you give the address and it gives you the, uh, the coordinates. It's called geocoding, and it's very cheap to do it, right? And then you need to automate this process, every week you do it. And then I just want to show you how it works. Uh, now I, I have the CSV file, and this is a, the, uh, I just, <coughs> so you have no information if it's render based or not? I have in this data. I, I just removed it because okay. it has a, a feature which is called uh, late last renovation. Okay. And then you can use these kind of uh, things. Now I download the data from here. I showed you here. I convert it to CSV and then I show it here to you, for example. Now it's a map of Switzerland with, with a rental price. And then imagine you can do it every week. So, and this was the idea that now we are, yeah, it's more than two years I'm talking with several companies, how to think about it like a, com like a business pr idea. So it's a lot, that's another story. I don't want to go through it. But here, I just want to show you how you can do the price estimation. And these are all the houses, right? These are all the features that you have. And then, for example, you just say, I want to know year of construction. And as you see here, the funny thing is that it's not that spatially correlated, actually. So because always in this field, people say, yeah, we know the region. But here, I, I can tell you that there is not a, a lot of a spatial correlation. It's not about region to say, but maybe yes, but look, for example, here, there's like this kind of colors. Yeah, I don't know, the year of construction. But you don't care. You just say, I don't care. That's, that's the best thing. Because if you care, you get trapped. In this, and then we we do this now. Now the idea here is that to predict the rents. That's it. And I use uh, scikit learn. You can use it also the same way. So I use this method, which is called the boosting. It's a working with the same thing. And always is like that. And these are I'm I'm telling you a bit of techniques. You you cannot just say my model is this accurate. You need to find a good way to show this. And this is the way you should evaluate your models. One of the most common way is out of sample predictions. So you always have training data, you should show the good results for the test data. The other one is cross validation, which means that you don't have a lot of data, you always say I have five fold cross validation. This is the term if you write a paper, for example. You divide your data to five equal sides, and then a part you take one out and then predict against the other. And then go to the next, predict it against, like take four of them, predict against it the fifth one. So, and that's it. And you see here, they have very beautiful structure. I really like this uh, scikit learn, and they did a lot of, work, I think, work on this. It's all fully open source. You just say, I need a decision tree regressor, and then I want to feed my X train, which is all of these dimensions, and Y is this. And then you have this function, for example, it's called uh, train test split. And then you just say, I want to have 30% of my data for testing. That's it. And then you just say, they have the same structure. Decision tree regressor, bagging regressor, random forest regressor, extra tree regressor, yeah. And this is, uh, this is uh, another one, which is scalable. So, and then you just have polynomials also. And if you run it, I, it takes a bit of time. No, actually it's fast. So it tells you that if you use decision tree regressor, you're already 90% accurate for your test data. And if you go, the other one is 93%. It is a really high value. If you claim that I have a website, uh, data is coming from public, everything is <laughs> for free, and I can predict. And I think in, in, your, in the US they did it, like with Zillow, they had this idea of uh, it's called Zestimate, and they became super famous. They said everywhere in the uh, US, if you, if you want to know what's the price of your house, you have it. And the thing is that at the moment, this service is not existing for them in Switzerland or most of uh, um, European countries. You should pay like 100 Swiss francs to just know what's the price. And here, the idea is that, for example, is a media business to change this game, to for free these, these services to people, and then they react on top of it. So you see that uh, just here, this is the best result, 93.5% accuracy on test. And then you have these uh, regressors. Which, are, which, which can't be that good. And this is the, what we discussed last week. And I think it's always like that. You need to write this pipeline, and then gradually I'm adding new techniques. But then you just need to know how it works. 
and then write this pipeline and then you just say this method, this method, this method. And then you will see which one is getting bet better. So then you can do also cross-validation and that's it. And then I would uh, suggest you, if you want to, I think, learn it better, go back to the last session uh, presentation and we had a neural network predicting these circles. Try to predict this real estate price and see which one gets better, give you better results. And for me, I didn't do it, but I think if you do it, it would be interesting. I guess this random forest would work better, even if you had a lot of layers. <coughs> so now, how it works? It's that simple. This line of code, you should find it. You need to dump the train model, and then later you run this Python code on a server. And, and yeah, that's... <laughs> so I don't want to go through these technicals. It's they have web frameworks. But... I'm, I'm laughing because they're really simple. If you're not uh, scared, you can develop a web application in one week and running machine learning on top of that. And if you have a good question, you can uh, start uh, pitching, for example, for money. So now this is the website. You're welcome to go there. It's online. So here is the price estimation. And then this is the data we had. Like for example, at the moment it's just for rent. And then this is the features you remember. You just say apartment, and then you just say next, and then you just say, and I didn't do it. I just paid 50 to someone. To, I mean, this is like, you need to know the whole machine learning is, is a lot about assembling things together. And I think then the role of, uh, I would say, architecting this system is really important. Where to get the data, how to clean it, and then which kind of models we can test. You just assemble. You don't need to write down anything from scratch. So, for example, you can say, yeah, we can test it. Huh? For example, this is where I live. And then you have these things. And the, the behind, when I s fill this form, it's like I'm having one of these rows data set. When I fill this form, I have I fill this part. And, the, and then I'm expecting the server give me, and the model is this trained model. So then you just say, this is my house, I don't know, and then you just submit, and it goes to the server side and it says, for example, this is the price, which is very cheap because it's very small. So I will show you the, the, uh, the back end side. And this was my, to build my first web application, and it works. So you need to go and then this is uh, the file, and you give this a space, and then you just run this Python code in this space. That's it, it's nothing different. And then you need, for example, I show you where is my code. For example, this is the website. And then these are all Python files. So let's uh, let's go one. There should be one Flask app. I don't know. I don't remember. Okay, app Flask app is fine. So this is you see is again Python. I just upload it in this environment, and then there should be prediction. So you see this is a prediction. It gets the data from the form, and then it gets this data set, it cleans them, and then it's careful that it's not garbage data set. And then it's, at the end, it calculates, uh, mm. at the end it's, uh, there should be some. Yeah, at the end you see, again you have this function, predict. And that's it, it's nothing different. And it gives you back this result. So you can write this pipeline easily. So this is, uh, yeah, it's like that. And then for example, you can do this kind of analysis. Now this was a question from an expert who wants to say that I have all the locations of buildings in Zurich. Can you tell me what happens if I have two scenarios of construction? One is like over of both uh, apartments and then I want to know what's the rental price for if it's two, in this case is three rooms, three rooms, floor one. In one case I have 60 square meter, another one 80 square meter. And then this is the result. And actually here I have 200,000 uh, points. Every time I calculate <coughs> two times, one scenario, 200,000 times this function, 200,000 results. Second time, uh, this result, this input, 200,000 results, and then subtract the value. So here, for example, you have the map of Zurich, uh, Zurich Canton, and then it tells you that, for example, in some areas, if you go, I mean, if you build 80 square meter, r regardless of the cost of uh, construction, you have up to 48% increase in your monthly rental price. So I don't know is it useful, but for example, you see that here you have kind of a spatial pattern. 
And yeah, yeah. I, I, I think usually it's the other way around because co developers they have a location they want to know what to say. They don't look for everywhere. But this was for Zurich Cantonal Bank, for example. Maybe they want to know. So and the, yeah, and then you can do a lot of uh, things which is not machine learning. You can s play, for example, with this. You say, if I am interested in this zip code, what are my chances to get a house? If I have if I want to have minimum two rooms, uh, minimum 50 square meter, and I can pay up to 3,000. So it tells you 40 out of 100. But if you say I can pay only 20,000, you have eight. So this kind of analysis, these are use cases. And also you can add these maps. These are for fun just. So you can add now, again, I have this data set. I can calculate price per zip code. I can use data from OpenStreetMap as I showed you. I downloaded all the buildings in, Sur in Switzerland, I calculated the center point, and then I estimated what would be the price per square meter of each of these buildings. So just for fun. You can add data set like this, noise level data set. And yeah, you need a group of people with, uh, uh, with the expertise in, uh, I would say, user interface design and then storytelling, but that's not my job. And then, for example, you have these data set also available, uh, transportation accessibility, and then you can check your houses, for example. You find some, some places, like here, for example. These are the data sets, for example. You just say, I found this in HomeGate. How, how good is that in terms of transportation or noise or whatever? And also, we can add uh, estimated rents to say, <laughs> now is that a good price, for example. So if you click, you go to HomeGate. These are all possibilities. And everything is just happening. And I'm not an expert in real estate. And I developed, to be honest, this. I mean, I'm talking about this a lot. But I, the whole development altogether was not more than three months of full-time work. You can do it also in any application. But you just forget about knowing how it works. <laughs> you know, not how it works about the context. Because the problem with expert is that they really want to check, for example, if they know why this real estate price is like this in this region, which is another thing. But here you just simply say, I don't want to know it. Because of that, I use random forest or whatever method. I can get data from wh wherever I like. And I know that there should be a meaningful context. So in principle, I can look at this uh, open street map. I can download all of them here. We don't use it, but you can use it also. So for example, one another way would be to m make a model that I say, which kind of factor do you care about, for example? And then you just say, this, this, this. Then I can qualify all of these buildings based on these factors. I say, how close is this to a bar? How close is this to kindergarten, and so on? And then uh, my, mo my model is to predict your uh, like, be whether you like it or not, based on the preference you give me. Or you can think about it like show pictures of this plus information, visualization. And then the user says, like this dating platform, to say this like, like, this like, this like. And then it's a binary classification. And the model should be able to learn from the pictures and this visual information whether you like it or not. And then for each person, in principle, you need to build one model. This is a kind of personalized model. These are all different questions that you can ask. And then, but if you go to the step of how to do it, it is always the same. And I, I can tell you that you can find a lot of uh, scientific questions. These are like more uh, like applications. You can find scientific questions that a lot of people are trying to understand things. <laughs> but then if with this method, it, it works better. So then it, there's a, always a, a paradox, whether this is an application or is it scientific contribution. If you go to a field and say, OK, guys, you're using this method, and it has a limit, you cannot understand it. But from the point of view of machine learning, this is just pure application, a like few lines of uh, random forest. And then if you show that you can solve the problem, then for you, I mean, if you, like for me, it's a kind of application, but then you can find a good contribution in, in the field also. That's, that's the thing. That's a different thing. I have a question about 93% precision mm -hmm. of the estimate. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that? Is 93% of the uh, estimates are correct, or that every estimate is uh, no? It's not probabilistic. You can you can you can interpret it both ways. But this means to to be exact. I had one more slide, but I removed it because I thought it's too much. 
but here it tells you that what is a median accuracy. So what is important, and I, I had it also in the previous year, like last year I had this presentation, what is really important is the distribution of error. Here, think about the distribution of error from like positive 100% error minus and so on, and the median error is 93%. And but what is important is the distribution, and then you will see that, with, for example, with, uh, with this uh, polynomial regression, always you have a very high variance because they don't learn it; they just have a good generalization. They are not; they are never close, but they are always good, up to 80 percent, because of that the variance is so big. But then with this, for example, you see, maybe I have it here. So that's 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 the important thing, actually. But when, they, when we say what is the 90% accuracy, this is uh, absolute uh, related error, median of absolute related error. Like if the price is 2,000 and you say 1,900, the difference is 100 divided by 200, but you got 2,000. This is the percentage. Just a moment and maybe it's here. Basically, you lose precision whenever you go to exceptions. Yes. So if you buy something very average at the very average area in the very yeah. then but as soon as you're but that's that's a lot about uh, the features also because here we are caring about price. But if you tell me what is your objective function or what is your objective feature, it's not just price. You say I care about these things. I think this is the subjective part. This is the example I told you about this picture, for example. Sometimes if you look at the pictures of inside of house, you just say, I like it or not. Or if you're an architect, you would look at the floor plans, for example. These are important features. So you can think about it that you have an encoder for floor plans plus an encoder for the environmental factors that it vectorizes the floor plan to a certain goal. And then you can even train it. it. It's not that fast yet, but you can train it for you as a person that whether you like it. And the price would be not a problem. For example, say, okay, I don't know. You can you can you can define your features. I think, uh, for example, I think I had it here last year. If it's not a problem. So this is the distribution error. For example, this is more or less the same data set, I guess. But then you see that this tells you that when the variance is very low, it's good. For example, it says decision tree is is very biased. It has a very good result for some of them, but the tails are so big. That's the, that's what we talked about this decision tree. But then with this ba uh, bagging re regressor, you have a smaller thing, a smaller uh, uh, tails, and then that's the whole thing. And then look, for example, with this uh, polynomial regression, it's so uh, uh, say fat, uh, yeah, right? Because it has no, it's called fat. <laughs> yes, it's called fat. <laughs> so, so yeah, and then. You see that this is why you use this. So this is the proper way. And the proper way, I think, is to even show these kind of values. For example, it says the median error is 4.7% error, and then, and the 20% of your data are below, uh, oh, no, sorry, 85% of your data have errors of below 20%. And for, for, the, for example, for this guy, 70% are below. So. 30% of your data get errors above the 20. So that's the that's I mean, important thing. So that means that the tool you showed before, the evaluation, mm -hmm. market prices or rents, is actually it's useful for a bank if you have a lot of, let's say, people with a lot of mortgages and there's distribution of remaining apartments. Okay. But if you're as an end user, it's interesting only one apartment, mm -hmm. then. Okay. The, yeah. No, it's possible both. I mean, for example, there is one use case that uh, this is more likely, I do not talk about it, that there is the idea of a uh, lead market, that for example, if you are looking for various outliers, in principle people are interested in outliers, not the ma main average. Because average is average, you say, okay, I, can, I don't lose or I don't gain a lot, but I look for outliers. So. What I can do is that I, I can, I can, one way is to show you this, this, I can tell you another story about it. The other way would be to say, uh, let's do it for all of these prices which are coming, and this is a kind of, uh, like, is like a chart, and this is what happens in real estate market. It, with this method, I can say every day there are like 20,000 houses. I calculate it, and then if there is a gap, 
between the asking price and the my estimation, that might be an outlier. So that's another use, and I, I can pay these, I can, uh, I, can, I can get money for these if I send this so-called lead to a real estate agent, for example, because they're looking for it. So here is not exactly for average, it's exactly for the opposite. And the other way that I like to do it, and this was the original idea, to make transparency in the markets. To what if I show here, because I don't believe that this is a good prediction also. So what if then after prediction, I put an uh, icon and I said, what is your expectation? And if you are a landlord, and if the prediction is lower than uh, the asking price, you get angry, you say, no, it should be higher, because I say it's 2,000, not 800, 100, 1,800. If you are tenant, you say, okay, go down. In an idealistic set setup, this becomes a media machine. So because what is important is that I can learn what is the willingness to pay. So, right? So because I can say, this is what I say, but it's just for creating some kind of paper. So you can use it for different ways. I think the most uh, simple way would be to use it just for prediction. And they don't buy it, actually. And that's not a good answer. I don't know. I know <laughs> nobody would pay for this if it's just prediction. But if you say, I have a mobile app that it sends you the lead. If you click on that, you should pay 20 Swiss francs. And if you get, uh, if you just uh, subscribe, you should pay a flat rate of 20. And if you click on that, you pay extra 20. So I know there are many people who do that. And as an idea, you can do it for cars, second-hand cars, for example. You want to buy a Volkswagen, this model, this year, second-hand, go to Auto Scouts and then check 20,000 results. And then you need to receive them every day and so on. But if it is machine learning, you can develop a model that tells you maybe you would like this. So it's, it's doing this automatically. So these are all possible. More kind of at life. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm done. So if you have questions or...